Hi, I am Martin Newman here, the Consumer Champion. Welcome to our Consumer Focus podcast. Welcome again to our regulars. We've got the wonderful Dave, the equally, possibly slightly more wonderful Leila, and the absolutely fabulous Marie Claire. And we're also delighted today to be joined by Andy Rubin, who is the founder of an amazing business called Trove, more of which you will hear about later. So thank you again, everyone, for joining. Um, just to start with the usual format, I want to get a sense of how the regulars are feeling about the world at the moment. We've uh, had a tumultuous week. Um, I was doing a presentation for a company called Knight Frank earlier in the week, and I was pontificating afterwards, talking to some of them in the bar, that I thought the war in Ukraine was about to end imminently, probably by the end of quarter one next year. And there I was on the way home, and all of a sudden on Sky News, it looks like we're going into World War III and a missile has sadly killed a couple of people in Poland. Thankfully, it now looks like that's not going to transpire, but I must admit, I did think I'd maybe called that one a little bit too early at that moment in time. Anyway, my instinct is I still think it's going to finish sooner rather than later, but, but uh, time will tell whether I'm right about that. How's, how, how are things? How are you feeling about things, Leila, in terms of just your general mood and the mood music that's going on at the moment, are you changing behavior at all? Are you cutting back on things? Have you started buying other things that you maybe stopped buying before? What's, what, how are you feeling about things? So I guess at the moment, everything feels quite unstable, um, which I'm sure is echoed by probably everyone here, you know, obviously in the wake of the news about uh, Meta and Twitter doing all the layoffs, um, it does make you think, my, you know, like that, that in itself is quite unsettling, just hearing about that many people out of work and you know, seeing these people trickling through on LinkedIn as well. And, um, you know, that plus um, the, the, the house, sorry, the um, cost of living crisis as well, whereby everything's getting more expensive. Um, you know, my mortgage, for example, is up for renewal in the next six months. And so um, that's an additional worry, kind of thinking, my God, is that, you know, is the recession going to be as bad as we thought? Is the, is the market going to bounce back? Um, yeah, so everything's a little bit kind of um, up in the air at the moment, I think, and there is definitely a, a kind of hesitancy when it comes to spending money on things that I think may be frivolous. Um, for example, you know, I'm um, we kind of have a running joke with our colleagues at work and who's put their heating on yet. You know, it's getting cold now, but I'm actually like refusing to put it on just yet because I think, well, that's just going to be the start of like astronomical energy bills. Um, yeah, so things feel a little bit kind of uncertain, unstable. Absolutely. Uncertain. And and off the back of all of that uncertainty and anxiety that you're feeling, are you are you consciously saving money in addition to maybe not, you know, looking to spend in certain areas? Are you diverting it elsewhere, or are you actually making sure that you've got a bit more money put aside just in case? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely um, a hesitancy to spend money on them, um, whereas I would have been a bit more kind of casual with it before. Um, you know, now I'm like, mm, do I actually really need that? You know, things like, um, I don't say clothes, eating out, um, holidays. I mean, I don't have any holidays booked in and I'm almost scared to scared to kind of like look at booking anything because I just think what's the landscape going to look like in six months, you know, three months, yeah. six months even. So, yeah. yeah, it just doesn't feel like a good time to be kind of, not holding on to your money at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Marie Claire, you've got a family. So what, what about you? How are you feeling about everything right now? Yeah, I, it's really worrying. I mean, the, when the direct debit goes up for the electricity bill, it, it's astonishing to me. And there's always a sort of call to them and say, OK, well, here's the meter reading and then there's a credit. But it's I, I'm I'm so shocked at the change. It, it really is. And I feel like um it's frightening. It's a frightening time. And it, you know, this just feels like there's this undercurrent, especially having people feel like they're sort of emerging from the pandemic and that life's going slightly back to normal. And now it's not. And there's a, you know, there is the war in Ukraine. There is this energy crisis, which it just sort of feels like um, we're, we're in, in suspended animation, really. Indeed, <clears throat> indeed. Dave, what about yourself? How are you? How are you feeling about everything? 
Yeah, I, I find it uh, a bit of a coincidence that we actually we're, we're coming together to do this episode on a day that I think there's a there was a budget announcement. So right. there was that, indeed, there was that indeed. falling on our laps means I haven't quite processed that. Um, but yeah, I'm still trying to keep positive and keep grinning throughout all of it. Uh, I say that as I've got a cup of, cup of um, hot lemon and ginger and I've got a hot, hot water bottle tucked in underneath my hoodie just to keep us. Does that, does that mean you haven't got your heating one as well then? Is that the cause and effect of that or is that why you're doing that? I think the heating's on at a sort of um, low temperature that's eventually yeah. going to warm up as we go later on. Yeah. If yeah. not, I'm just going to stick a pizza in the oven, open that up and um, use that as, as a bit of heat, you know. Lateral, lateral. <laughs> But I, I'm too old. I can't go without heat. And, uh, but I need the water bottle as well. So uh, I can empathise. I do think, and again, it's just my instinct. And as I say, time, the one thing with predicting the future is obviously nobody can say to you right now that you're wrong. They can come back and tell me in the future that I'm wrong. But my instinct is I think things are going to calm down in Ukraine. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of what we are experiencing at the moment are byproducts of that crisis and what's going on over there. Because you know, energy costs and so many other factors, the increasing cost of goods, various things can be tied back to some extent to the disruption that that's caused to the global economy and different industries. So obviously when that does stop, whatever it is, <clears throat> it will take time for the, for, the, for the benefits, if you like, of getting back to normality to unwind. And absolutely you're right to call out all the things that you are at the moment. And it's just an incredibly unsettling time. I mean, and I think I mentioned this the last time. I don't remember in my lifetime, I'm 56, the last time we had anything close to this, and it definitely wasn't as bad that I can recall was in the 1970s. Uh, we had a relative period, although we had, you know, the global financial crash in 2008, 2009, you know, it still didn't, I don't think, feel as severe as and as uncertain as the time that, you know, that we're going through at the moment. And you talked about, you talked, Leila, there about even, you know, holding off and, you know, booking a holiday. So I think whereas maybe a few months ago, when we were well and truly out of the pandemic and out of lockdowns, and it was clear we were moving ahead without any more of those, hopefully, um, that people were indulging and getting, you know, going abroad and, and treating themselves. But it sounds now that that's on the back burner for you. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, you know, I went on a few trips um, over the summer and actually the last one I went on, which was kind of September time, um, the flight cost had gone significantly up as well. I think I flew to Italy um, and we, I had a heavily discounted flight, um, but it was still over £400 return. And that would, you know, a year ago, two years ago, or before pre-pandemic, that would have been less than half the price and now yeah. I just I'm always too scared to look because I'm just like I don't even want to get my hopes up because I'm not going to pay you know like so many hundreds of pounds for flights that we would be getting for like under 100 pounds for example beforehand and um yeah it just it, I don't know it just doesn't feel like a very stable time to be going on holiday for me like I just you know that's kind of the first luxury that really goes for say for example if I'm trying to double down and you know save money are you still buying clothes out of curiosity Still buying fashion? Um, yes, but not in such a cavalier way as I was before. So um, it has to be a very considered purchase. And, um, you know, like I really have to question, you know, can I upcycle something that I've already got? Um, you know, do I really need to buy something else? Because obviously I'm also conscious of the, the sustainability and the waste element as well. Yeah. Um, so really trying to not, um, you know, because I think it's almost like not even fashionable anymore to be going around in like new, new things, is it? Um, you know, people are becoming more conscious of, um, you know, re-wearing old things or repurposing. Yeah, what's that What's that phrase about shopping your own wardrobe or something, I think, isn't it? And reminding yeah. yourself of all the all the products that you've already got or the styles you've already got. Dave, what, what are you doing? Are you doing anything to treat yourself at the moment or... Literally, are you kind of holding back on everything? Yeah, I, I feel like this is all happening coincidentally because I was targeted by Hotels.com yesterday telling me I could get just two nights, uh, what, what, two loyalty stamps for staying one night, so double the amount of loyalty stamps. <laughs> and I'm on my eighth stamp, so I could easily get to my tenth one and get an extra night free. Um, in terms of treating myself, you know, I'm still trying to appreciate that which we do have in life. Um 
I haven't quite yet got back to like this weekly thing. So a weekly thing might be go get a pizza on a Friday or go get a like special coffee on a Monday morning because it's the start of the week. I'm I'm not fully yet doing that, but I did go get a cheeseburger the other day and I was like if there's a if there's a justifiable reason to have a tiny little experiential treat, I think I might well do it. Particularly if we're gonna have weather like we did recently and you know you're gonna be stuck indoors and it's pouring down with rain. And the cheeseburger's even more tempting. Any any but any particular brand? <laughs> um, I am guilty of discovering. I know I knew it was about because um I've got my one share in them. Uh the brew dog um bar that's at Waterloo. And I couldn't I, I saw the publicity about it, couldn't find it. And then one day uh my bike had to go in for repairs because it had a puncture. Uh, I can fix a puncture, but I wanted it serviced as well, just to be clear. Um, so I had, you know, all this time to burn um, and I'd sort out the place and it's huge. It's absolutely huge. So I went Good down, enough. ordered the double, uh, the two for one vegan burger and a pint. And I started messaging my mates about the place. So, yeah, I Good think enough. every day should be an experience. It's just whether or not you choose to part with some cash. Yeah, indeed. Well, I'm I, I'm partial to five guys myself. I must admit. So, thankfully, I'm not living anywhere near one. Otherwise, my my weight would be in trouble. To be honest with you, because uh, I was in Australia recently, and I think I had about four while I was there. Yeah, this is one of the moments. You know, I spent a lot of my career at Walmart. This is one of the moments that I really miss the the data that you used to be able to observe as society moves. And one of the memories I have is working a register in different economic times. And as people don't have enough money at the till, when the total rings up, the question is always what they take out of their cart. Right. And that's very different depending on the economic times. And one of the things that you would see depending on the times is that people would buy nail polish as a way to treat yourself. It's a very inexpensive purchase. It freshens things up. You would see DVDs, you would see movies, entertainment. And I would watch milk come out of a cart, but not nail polish. And I think that these trade-offs right now are fascinating, the questions you're asking and how kind of in small ways we all deal with not just the, the micro situation, but the uncertainty, right, of what might happen and the, the need to just be a little bit closer to a little bit tighter with what we do. Yeah, it's a really good point. To that point, Mary Claire, are you uh, depriving depriving the family of anything in order to in order to make sure you've got the latest nail polish? <laughs> Or anything else? No, we've had since the first lockdown a couple of staycations in the UK, but we haven't ventured abroad. And then I had Eurostar messaging, emails, the £29 returns are back, which was very tempting to Paris. So we booked that for the new in the new year, uh -huh. which really feels like a massive deal because we haven't had that oh we couldn't get our flight or we you know things were all cancelled and I feel like because it was only 29 pounds return I'm fine fine with that um but you know Christmas is coming up and what is I'm finding really maddening is how quickly it's being how soon it's being advertised because you know we are in a, in a crisis and that all the trees have gone up and I kind of feel like how are they getting this so wrong because once those adverts start to come on it's just kids constantly saying oh and I want this on my Christmas list and I want this on my Christmas mm. list it, it starts too early so has it gone has it actually gone earlier this year for all of you in terms of your awareness do you think compared to last year or the year before any other thoughts on that just in the, the the retail rule was try not to break Halloween. Yeah. Right. At least in the US, the rule was try not to launch Christmas before October 30th. That was kind of the yeah. that was this the non-explicit line. And for the most part, I think people have stuck to that. And of course, now you've got Black Friday, and Black Friday is not Black Friday. Black Friday is a, a one or two week event yep. in most cases. Um yep. rolling. That's right rolling straight into straight into Christmas. And it's a good time to bring you in a bit more a bit more formally now. So look, thank you very much for 
joining us today. It's a privilege to have you on here. You know, you're an incredible, you've got an incredible CV and um, owning responsibility for, I know you did various jobs, but owning responsibility for sustainability at the world's largest retailer, Walmart, is no small undertaking. Um, I'm just keen to know, before you tell us a bit about what you do today with Trove and everything, maybe give us an idea of how, th how you think things have changed over the past 15 years in terms of sustainability. What have you, has it, has it happened quicker? Are we adopting change quicker? Are brands changing quicker? How do, what's your view? We go back 15 years, they're just, there are moments and I think they're punctuated. And for me, there was a moment in the 2000s that I was a part of, um, GE was a part of it, um, Hank Paulson at Goldman, Nike, there were some major brands. And I think in the, in the mid early 2000s, corporations in large part, sustainability or at that time ESG came into the boardroom. And it was the first time that really, I think we had seen corporations realize this is about license to grow. And this wasn't something you had a two person department thinking about compliance. You had to actually think about your license to grow. However, in the early 2000s and what I saw, it was largely about eco-efficiency. So how do we make progress in making a sweater with better, you know, using less material? How do we look at our supply chain and save on waste here or do this here? And everything got a little bit leaner and more efficient. And what we've seen now, then I think we went through a period of another 15 years. And what we've all seen is that those efforts don't add up. In fact, we've gone backward from a fashion and a, a consumer standpoint, that there is no amount of making every item more efficient that adds up to what we are kind of what our what we look at as society. So you can make, you know, one of the examples that I think about quite a bit when I was, I, I went from sustainability becoming obsessed with products. And I moved at Walmart from sustainability to private brands with the thought that if I could oversee, I think at one point my PL was 4% of US food. And my thought was knowing what I know about sustainability, we'll just address these different product categories and make things better. What I realized, you know, we would take the plastic resin out of a fork. If you've seen the forks where the handles are cut out, 13% less resin, but then we sold twice as many. <laughs> and I think in the last 15 years, we've all realized that those efforts to remove resin from a plastic piece of plastic cutlery where you sell twice as many, we are using more resin. We have more... Th the average U.S. customer bought 64 items last year compared to 12 pieces of fashion in the 1980s. So you can make a sweater have less impact all you want, but when you sell five times as many, it's you're not getting anywhere. So I think that we have come to realize that the exact, like it's a long way of saying that the system itself that's, that's predicated on growth of brands right now is completely predicated on growth of new products, which is predicated on growth of manufacturing. And until we figure out new ways that brands can grow without needing to grow production of new items, we're really not having the real conversation. I think it's a really, well, it's obviously a very, very relevant and very interesting point. But just on that, I mean, don't you also think that from a consumer point of view, I mean, I talk about this stuff a lot. I'm not the world's expert in it the way you are, but I talk about it a lot. And I feel that we've all got guilt increasing levels of guilt mm. around consumption as, as consumers, as human beings, you know, in terms of yeah. what we buy, where we buy, what we buy, where we buy, whom, from whom we buy, and the impact of yes. that on the planet. Do you not think it's also incumbent upon the brands to help us and to help us find a, find a pathway to being better consumers? Or do you think that the responsibility yeah. lies with us? What's your thoughts on that? I would love it if the brands, I mean, it ultimately, ultimately why we in my company right now choose to work with brands is because brands make up so much of our world. And as brands move things forward in a meaningful or consequential way, the world moves. Brands have so much influence and ability to do that. Yet, I think we've got to be realistic in what makes sense for a board of directors who oversees, right, or an executive group at a brand. The winners in today's brands and society have won based on the way that the landscape has been set up for the past 50 years. 
what we are looking at for the next 50 years will look different than the last 50 years as it always does. And the, the brands that understand ways to both, you know, to basically to grow, brands will need to grow their business. It's how they grow their business. And if they can figure out, and it's hard, but we've got idea, their ideas out there and it's innovation. There are ways that brands can grow their business without growing their emissions. And the need for that in the support and loyalty and um, customer love they will get from doing that will make them the winners tomorrow. Yeah. Because there is a group of customers, we talked about Gen Zs and millennials, who is more who are more aware of what is going on and more realistic and more informed than any group of customers I've ever come in contact with. 100%. Smarter, more um, connected to information. I've been naive about it where I thought people were saying we want sustainability, but didn't really understand what that meant. I spent, um, I spent a full day with a group of 30 Gen Zs in addition to the two I live with um, about three weeks ago and was blown away at how well-informed, realistic, in the level of understanding that this group of individuals had about corporations and brands. So yes, I would love to see brands do this. I don't think many brands are really doing meaningful work yet. The brands that can figure out how to do this will absolutely be the winners. We will talk about three decades, two decades from now. Well, I'd agree with that. I think, <clears throat> I think, you know, they need to be, they need to really wake up, waken up because, you know, I just heard something today actually that by 2025, Electric vehicle ownership in the UK will be 50% of all vehicles will be electric. Yeah. Uh, I bought, I traded in my fancy car, fast can, um, gas guzzling machine recently for yeah. an electric vehicle, and I absolutely love it. And I managed to drive to Bournemouth and back last weekend. Won't mean anything to you, Andy, but you know it was um, it was a good 250 miles. Gave me a lot of confidence. Um, but I yeah. think, excuse me. The point I want to make is. The, 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 the automotive industry have been really caught out by the level of adoption of electric vehicles. Yeah. And I think the same thing is going to happen in fast fashion and other sectors. And I think that's the thing that's going to take a lot of brands, you know, by surprise. I just want to open up to the, if you don't mind, let me, let me just open up to the panel. Yeah, please. of course. Yeah, because I'd love to get their thoughts. Um, Leila, I, you, you might want to talk to Andy. I mean, I don't know what your thoughts are, but I mean, as I said, we've all got, guilt about our consumption so we've got a real expert on the call here and um, maybe you want to ask him about how, how do we do a better job as, as consumers you know any tips on how we get better at sustainability because it's not an easy it's not an easy path to, to draw to, or to trade even no absolutely um and it's an interesting one because i know from personal experience you know when it comes to in the last i guess year few months and when it comes to buying a gift for example like I don't want to like I don't want to buy lots of plastic tat for um you know whoever it is I'm buying a gift for you know I get things from Amazon sometimes which I kind of feel guilty about but it's convenient and you know I'm always conscious of mm -hmm. not having like plastic type things and I mean even recently I bought um I really wanted like a nice new duvet but I kind of spent a little bit more money on one that was sustainably sourced and recycled materials and so <laughs> You know, these kind of things. And I think that, that like, um, you know, I mean, I'm definitely not Gen Z, but I think that even, um, you know, myself, I kind of have that in my head when I'm buying something. But I know that, you know, like what you said around, it's, it's almost kind of a false economy where you, um, you know, the, the number of units that you're producing kind of offsets the reduction in um, usage of particular materials. So, um, yeah, it'd be quite interesting to know, um, like what your advice would be if you are trying to cut down on say, you know, plastic, for example, like buying plastic in consumer products mm -hmm. and what really you should be looking at. Yeah, this out. is where, this is where as individuals, the individual shift in society, I believe has changed. It is dramatically different than it was 15 years ago. Even the way that you are talking about what you're looking for and what's bothering you is different than I recall 20 or 30 years ago. What we now need and what I believe is missing are the options that you have at your disposal to make decisions that you would like to make because there aren't a lot of options. It sounds like there was for the duvet, but if there, when there's an option for me to buy something I feel better about and I can do it with high trust and get two days shipping, but the, the whole option makes way more sense to me, I'm in. And that's where I think that brands have not just a risk in, in being behind the times, 
but an opportunity as they like you're either leading off the front or you're falling off the back. It's very hard to, you've got to lead off the front. And what I am, what I am watching the brands that we work with do is provide Patagonia is providing options for people to buy new or worn wear pre-owned items, making that option as easy as it is to buy new where you can buy a, you can buy a, a you know, down sweater, for half of what a new down sweater would cost and you know that it's it's being sold for the third time good for them for making that op option open to all of us and making that so easy and shipped in two days that to me is just where it's where the brands that get that will be the brands we'll be talking about in years to come and the brands that don't it's a fine way to go they just won't be around as far as i'm concerned you don't have to become an environmentalist you can just be out of business Mary Claire, anything you'd like to ask Andy around how you might pursue being more sustainable? Yes, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go with toys because I always feel like we're sort of fighting the tide of plastic with um children's toys. Yeah. And you know, we have a lot of really nice wooden things that were played with a lot when my daughter was a toddler and a whatnot but and we haven't got rid of those <laughs> but I do feel that everything now that is of appeal is again it feels like it's just plastic I don't know where it's come from yeah. and it yeah. bothers me yeah I mean the the uh, the biggest thing that I know of to be done right now is to look for things that are made differently and it's not going to be everything. I think there's a there's a concept right now around eating about um, weekday veg. I think the same can be true for anything in life. I think it can be true for toys too. Finding a few toys that you get from places where they're handed down or they're board games that were made different because I don't know if any if you've ever experienced the board games that were made 20 years ago that are on eBay somewhere. They are fantastically different than the ones you buy at a um, discounter right now. They feel different. They play, they're just, they're made differently and you can find them for quite a bit less. So I think even, you know, of a, of a Christmas list, finding a few of those items from other people and, and, and using the holidays, especially Thanksgiving, using these holidays as ways to, um, at least in the U S to, to give back and pass things on feels great. So we do see a recent, surgeons in those things and even if you're not going to make a complete shift in lifestyle even a few items of the ones you purchase makes a difference and ultimately for anyone looking to make a difference i would encourage people to not be make any difference you can personally but look for the places of leverage so one individual one individual um extra plastic bottle recycled is fine that's good but there are places of leverage in society that we really need. So what people do in their jobs, right? Regardless of what job you're in, looking for the ways that the company you're at can make a meaningful shift. Those things have leverage. And I think we're at the point in society, we need things of more leverage right now, in addition to individual interest, but we need, we need high leverage. Yeah, indeed. Voting matters. Yeah. Yeah, no, I talk about that a lot. I mean, I, I think that, you know, there's no point in us as, in, as individuals trying to be more sustainable, but then working for a business that doesn't also encourage us to do it, right? So they should be encouraging us to do it not only in our personal lives, but also in our work environment and providing in whatever way they can the, the facilities for us to become more sustainable for sure. Dave, what about yourself? Any questions for Andy in relation to sustainability? Um, I don't know if I can drum up any questions, even though the next thing I was going to say is when I was training to be a journalist, it's funny, I have no questions. Uh, it would always be to, you know, look at the facts and try and flip them, see if there's a point to make. And I guess I'm pretty shocked by the story of uh, one of your companies that you've worked with in the past, putting less plastic in, but selling more units of that, you know. A lot of products yeah. have the little flash, they have the little labels on them that say, you know, now made for 30%. And, uh, you know, certain things I realize that companies will have a message and say, 
you know, we're, we're, we're behind this cause. And part of me is like, well, no, I think you just want the money from that particular audience demographics pockets to be in your profits. Um, yeah, I, I never would have thought that the label that says 30% less plastic in our packaging would equal 60% more sales. I think it. I, we can still say it's better to have 30% less plastic, but what it doesn't get us, that it doesn't get us to a model that actually makes sense in society, right? That we are, we are doing things, we're making decisions today that are going to, to allow future generations to have the same quality of life we have now, which is ultimately when we talk about sustainability, that's what we're talking about in my mind. And so I think that there is a broader picture and I feel like the, the, the younger customers that I'm spending time with are the most attuned to the reality of what we're talking about here. I believe those customers are less, um, are more aware than I was when I would see those same packaging labels, given the information they have access to in their own interest and need to seek that information out and to realize that 30% less plastic on a package, fine, but that is not going to solve the challenge we have ahead of us. We need more systemic solutions and models, and those customers will reward the brands that are able to separate and, and work on a bigger solution. In addition, it's fine to have 30% less plastic. Um, we, we, we shouldn't buy items with 30% more plastic, right? Like it's better, but it's not sufficient. I guess um, your background looks at customers, um, but I guess, I guess so I am going to ask you a question. Uh, when you're interviewing and sitting down with these panelists of different generations, uh, millennials yeah. and Gen Zs, I think you said, um, they're of course aware, they're savvy. Do you see them making any kind of proactive choices beyond uh, maybe what they do at the businesses you consult for? For example, I'm buying a lot of secondhand camera lenses and I'm seeing a lot yeah. of Facebook marketplace activity. Is that across the yeah. board in your experience? Absolutely across the board. And it, um, there was, go back 10, 15 years ago, people would buy secondhand because they had to. People today buy secondhand because it's smart, because it's, it aligns with people's values. It saves them money. It allows them to access aspirational brands they couldn't access before. The conversations I hear from younger customers are, why, of course we would do this. Why wouldn't we do it? And eventually what people will say is, I imagine this conversation in my head 20 years from now where I'm talking to someone and they say, so what did you used to do with an Arc'teryx jacket that you just weren't wearing anymore? You just left it in your closet? And I would say, yes. And they would, they would look at me confused and say, that's kind of dumb. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Why don't you just bring it back to Arc'teryx? And I would try to explain that we live in a world where we just buy things, buy things, buy things, and never think about what happens to them after. And they'll look at me like, that's crazy. And so we are going to move into a world where not only, not only are brands that sell well-made items that have demand after the first sell going to be the more interesting brands and the more interesting products, customers that are growing into being a larger share of customers will also expect when they're no longer using an item, it still has value. If they bought a piece that actually was a piece worth buying, they'll hand it back. And the brands that they are closest to will make that easy. And we see it with, um, we see it with certified pre-cars, your pre-owned cars right now. So Mercedes has an incredible pre-certified program, Lexus in the U.S. No one, you know, people expect if they buy a Lexus, they can walk it back on that drivers on that dealer lot three years later. We do it with Apple products today. We trade in our iPhone 13s for our iPhone 14s right when we buy the 14. Because that is the moment where you no longer need your iPhone 13 because you're getting your iPhone 14. And Apple makes it very clear that your iPhone 14 is less expensive because you're trading in your 13. Then they're selling the 13 to a new customer. And they're expanding their customer base and they're, they're building their loyalty. Good moment now, I think, Andy, to tell us a little bit more or tell us actually about Trove. Tell us about your business. How did yeah. it... How did it come about? What was the inspiration? And, and more importantly, what do you do today to help the businesses that you're working with? So we talked a bit about uh, the roles that I've been in before. And I think I, I clearly had a moment um, overseeing private brands where I realized we needed to create models for brands to grow without, without producing new things. We needed to get in, in the obvious 
solution was to get more use out of the quality items that we had. Yet there weren't models that made it easy for brands to do that. There were many brands that produced incredibly valuable items and they just didn't have models for it. So about 10 years ago, I left Walmart to start what's now Trove. And in the last six years or so, we've come to realize the whole focus of, the, of this change is going to happen through brands. That the brands who make these items are the ones who can really benefit from and service all of us through better models of getting more use out of what we've already made. And so Patagonia was the, so what Trove, um, we, what Trove does is the logistics and technology for some of the best brands in the world that helps these brands buy back these items from all of us, um, refurb, list these items, which are then typically bought by new customers from this brand. And really what they're doing is they're using their quality items to acquire new customers and to build greater loyalty with existing customers, where the items are not just a transactional way to bring in a sale, but the items become a thread, a way to keep a relationship and really cement um, a relationship around an experience, not the transaction with the customer. So that's been now 10 years. Patagonia was the first brand we worked with back in 2016. We now work with brands like Lululemon and On Running and Allbirds and REI and Nordstrom and a range of brands. Um, and the industry has also moved a tremendous amount. So when we launched back with Patagonia, it was the first brand I'm aware of ever doing this in a formal way. And it was a crazy idea. There are over 100 brands right now today with buyback and resale programs. So the world has moved quite a bit. Younger customers have moved, brands have moved. And I think we're all coming to realize that it's um, it's somewhat obvious. We're just missing the business models to really make this oh, uh, an obvious way of doing business. Yeah. It's interesting when you, you when you were rhyming off, I appreciate it was only a, probably a small subset of all the brands that you work with, but the ones that you were mentioning, they're almost exclusively all case studies that I talk about when I'm doing, when I'm presenting or I'm doing my education yes. around, around customer centricity. Yep. Um, and in my mind, when I look at those businesses, they're truly customer centric in everything, in, in everything that they do. So it makes perfect sense that they're That's doing right. this. I mean, they look after their people well, they create great employee experiences, they have yes. genuine values, they're authentic, they're transparent, they have great leadership. Um, and so, you know, being responsible from a planet perspective and, and, a, and a sustainability perspective, you know, makes an awful lot of sense to me. Exactly right. And Selfridges is another brand that we do not work with, but you you write about. And it's one of the brands that lately has had um, one of the very few retailers to look at scope three emissions and sustainability. Scope three emissions are the products that a retailer would sell themselves. And it's difficult because retailers have very little influence over those emissions. Yeah. And the leaders who really will gain share will figure out, will set a course that makes sense for their customers and then figure out, right? They'll use that as a way of driving innovation to get there. Mm -hmm. And I've been so impressed with the leadership there to set a goal for scope three emissions and set a goal for circularity in concert with the scope three emissions goal, because they know that getting more use out of the things, out of the relationships of their customers, making it easier for all of us to bring back items and buy items that have already been owned is going to be a way for them to address the broader emissions. That's an incredible leadership. Do you feel, and I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised to hear that, I know quite a few people at Selfridges, but I just wanted to understand as well from your perspective, I mean, I've sat on a number of retail boards and I, <clears throat> I genuinely mm -hmm. believe that this is one of these topics, if you like, or challenges that certainly historically we paid a fair bit of lip service to it. And it, and it was, it's a little bit like diversity and inclusion. We know we need to do it, but it's difficult. That's right. So we'll tick a box, we'll do the minimum or we'll prove That's that right. we're doing something. Do you really feel it's become more than that now in most of the businesses that you talk to, not necessarily your clients? Do you feel yeah. it's something that's really understood in terms of the importance and in what you were saying about Gen Z's You've got two Gen Zs at home. I've got two Gen Zs at home. And they will absolutely, as you know, hold us to account on our behavior and our actions. 
But do you really yeah. feel boards are, are 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 across this the way they should be? No, I don't. I think that it is like any trend. That's it, trends probably the wrong word. Change of this magnitude. The things that I do know, it is there is no there is no there is no future without getting more use out of the things we've made. A hundred percent. There is no the trajectory we're on right now will not work and will not make sense. I know that the way that younger generations shop is almost exclusively this way for many reasons, including the ones we talked about, sustainability, value, everything else. I also know that there are enough brands that are doing this that it will quickly become expected. And with those three ingredients, which I do believe are true, the boards that are not seeing that are really set up for a shock. Because when you have those three ingredients, when customers are making a move this significant, when there are enough brands that actually are noticing that and setting up ways that customers can have the options they want to have, the brands that are doing that will all of a sudden realize how fast this will move. How fast this moves, no one knows. Does it happen in three years? Does it happen in five years? No one knows. But because of those factors, it is absolutely inevitable. Yeah. Well, I think if you if you just take the stats that I talked about earlier about electric vehicle ownership in the UK, yeah, being forecast to now be fifty percent by twenty twenty five. I mean that is incredible. You know, I mean yep. that's way beyond the level that the automotive brands thought it would be by twenty twenty. Eh, sorry, by twenty thirty. Um, yep. And we've still got seven years, or by that time, we'll have five years right. to go to the to the end of the decade. You know, it's quite remarkable. It's such a good, when, when you were talking about that electrical vehicle stat, I was thinking about where I was in 2004. I was sitting in a room in Aspen, Colorado with 50 people that were the, they were the environmental leaders. I won't share who was there, but it was the, you know, you had the secretary of energy there. This was a room of people who knew what they were talking about. And we were talking about that same stat that will be true now in, would you say 2030? It well, was 2025, 50% of- okay. Vehicle ownership in the UK will be electric vehicles. So the belief then was that in 10 years, so in 2014, people thought we would be where we will be in 2025. So the time frame of what people thought was 10 years off. And these were the smartest people in 2004 in the room. But the inevitability of that shift was clear at that moment. And if you look at the US automotive brands and you look at the people who got the trend right and missed the trend, I think what's likely to happen in any kind of shift like this is companies will look at it and say, look, the electric car launched in 2004. It didn't work. We've tried that. It didn't work. And that is, um, I think that that is almost more detrimental to not trying it at all. Yeah. And what many brands fail to see is where a trend is actually an inevitable long-term trend where we haven't gotten it right yet, but that doesn't mean it's not inevitable and doesn't mean it's not going to happen. And you never want to be behind that. I think, I think what, uh, what that, the segue for that from that for me is I always talk about technology and that we always, always overestimate the impact of technology in the short term, but we underestimate its impact in the long term. And that's exactly 100%. what we're talking about. You know, all those big brains, including yourself, are sitting in a room predicting the future that 100 percent was going to happen. You just, you know, we, you just overestimated, I guess, the, the level of adoption and pace yeah. towards that. It's like driverless vehicles. These things are coming. Right. It's just that we thought right. they would be there. If you read the hype, you think they would be there five or six years ago. I remember yes. presenting on stage in, 20, in 2008 and people were talking about this is the year of mobile commerce. The smartphone only came out in 2007. <laughs> you know, it only 2007. Been and everybody was saying this is the year of mobile commerce. I mean, it was madness. But anyway, right. I want to go back Absolutely. to the, go back to the panel now just to talk about what you're doing around any changes of behavior around conscious consumption and maybe how are you changing? So let Leila, let's start with you. Anything significant or conscious in 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 your choices about what you do, what you buy, where you go around sustainability that you're that you're all that you have obviously made in the last year or two or planning to make? 
Um, so, yeah, I think in terms of food um, is an interesting one because I've always been a bit of a kind of flexitarian um, and, you know, kind of toyed with the with the concept of giving up fish and chicken and stuff. But actually, in the last year, I think there's been so much noise about it. And I think also it's, it's really important to note that um, these kind of behaviours are being very much normalised now. We're starting to see that they're being normalised. People are leading by example. So, for example, you may, um, I think Dave mentioned ordering a, a vegan burger previously, actually, like I may have been, you know, wanted to have that with a group of friends, you know, five years ago, but been a bit embarrassed to order it because people would be like, oh, they'd scoff at it. But actually now it's the norm. You know, everybody in my group would be ordering the same thing. And even people who would normally eat meat would be, you know, quite happy to order a vegan burger. And so I think that it's um, it's interesting because there people have a tendency to kind of collectively um, bury their heads in the sand, I think. And so, you know, like all of these kind of terrible global issues are going on, but actually, you know, I just want to eat a burger right now, or I just want to buy a bit of plastic right now. But I think that the more that people are kind of, you know, leading by example with that behavior, as we're seeing the behavior start to pick up, um, you know, there is a bit of like normalization of, of sustainable behaviors, which is really great. And I think, um, you know, just in terms of like buying habits and shopping and things like, um, you know, just even like the process of going shopping, you know, I always have a canvas bag on me so I don't end up, I don't, you know, mm -hmm. have to just pop to the shops and use plastic or, um, you know, I, I, I will buy British as opposed to imported where possible, um, you know, thinking about the carbon footprint of things, whether that's food or goods or whatever. And I'm not, I, you know, I don't, I will, I will pay a little bit more um, if a product is uh, sustainable, um, you know, or I'll go out of my way to seek out a brand that, you know, that, that does, use sustainable products as opposed to um you know not and for example i won't touch kind of cl like say um clothes from shops where they they are known to use sweatshops and you know like underhand methods of making cheap items and things and so um you know yes it means that i'm spending more money on individual items but i'm buying less of them um so i think that's definitely you know a consideration of not just bringing lots of things into the house and having to you know having this big kind of pile of stuff because it's now more about um, quality, I think, and sustainability, and what the brand is is um, yeah. what the yeah. brand stands for. I think is really important. Good examples there, Leila. Thank you, my Claire. What about you and your family? Any any obvious changes as you try and reduce your carbon footprint? Well, I've used a couple of times the app Too Good to Go, um, where I've had these magic bags from Planet Organic, <laughs> just off Bermondsey Street, where I wouldn't go and shop in Planet Organic because of the cost, but there's something really feel good about, okay, that was going to get, well, I don't think they do chuck much of their stuff because they've got such a good deal on here, but you're getting about £12 worth of random stuff that I've maybe paid £3.75 for or something, and there's a commitment to it because I have to pre-book it, and then mm. we eat for dinner the next night, whatever's in that bag interesting interesting so it's a it's a it's very much a well you know there's a, an element of surprise and delight about that hopefully more hopefully more delight and not only surprise yeah. <laughs> and also i've never been afraid of the um the yellow barcode aisle i will go there i'll buy it stick it in the freezer and then um feel great about having this massively discounted thing and also we have we are eating a lot less meat and fish we've we've we're not you know half and half but definitely um using more pulses in things and expanding the repertoire yeah well i guess within with the example you gave of too good to go you're you know you're you're having a positive impact on the planet because ultimately you're helping you're helping to reduce the wastage at the end of the day and you're taking advantage of it as a mm. consumer Dave, what about yourself? Any, any, any? I know that you take your bike many places. Um, any other concerted efforts around reducing your carbon footprint or being more sustainable? Yeah, um, I can vouch for the two good to go one because I made that habit in lockdown. Um, they'd only give away stuff as the business was closing up, maybe eight nine p.m. So I'd head out my bike ride, swing round, put my order in, and pop, you know, pop dinner for tonight and tomorrow morning into the bag. Um, yeah, 
I think also the thing about having a bike is that I can only put so much in my bag that I can put on my back, which is limiting how much that I'm putting into the basket. So that's another good thing. It means that I'm not, um, you know, buying frivolous bits of food. I am when I can. And I used to go a bit more before, but now I'm going a bit less. Go to Waitrose so we get the, um, the, the, the British over the too much imported or the seasonal if it's not British. Um, and then the plastic bag, yeah, that's long gone, that's dead. There's always a canvas bag handy stuffed into each jacket before I head out just in case. And I always joke with my chippy that, you know, do I want a plastic bag? I'm like, no, you're going to sacrifice a plastic tree. I do that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually <laughs> wondered if Andy was aware of the plastic bag situation in the UK and is it the same um, in America and other markets? Well, you know, I, I live in San Francisco and you, you know, Plastic bags have basically been banned in San Francisco since I can remember. So it is uh, so many thoughts that there is a social change, right? That I think we've touched on here that when that happens, it, it happens faster than we think because of, um, because of what we see other people doing, right? We're social creatures in the end. And I think as those options become more available or mandated, right? Those are options that are becoming normalized because of legislation where that is, I would love more. I, I think legislation around um, carbon would make an, I mean, I think it's a no brainer, but I don't expect we're gonna get there fast enough. So in that case, we're gonna need other solutions that are gonna bridge this gap right now. Even this conversation is the, the fact that when we're having this conversation here, that people are acting in any way different is a significant shift compared to 15 years ago. So I just don't wanna lose sight of even, regardless of the answers in the, in the different approaches people are taking, the fact that people know what approach they're taking and what they're actually thinking about doing is dramatically different than 15 years ago. Yes. And I think that that in itself is showing a change in society and that that is where the opportunity and the responsibility and the kind of the, the staying ahead that brands and retailers can think about and what options they make available is just good business. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Listen, thank you so much. I'm very grateful to you all for joining today. I'm very grateful to Dave, to Leila and to Marie Claire, my regular panelists. So thank you so much for your time. I know you're all busy, juggling lots of different things. And I'm very grateful to Andy Rubin, the, the founder, and CEO of Troll for joining us. Any brands listening to this today, if you're behind the curve on sustainability, then I think you know who to go and talk to. Um, Trove is certainly a, a business that can help you to uh, re-evaluate and maybe come up with a new model for your products, for the sustainability of your products, for the circular economy, and for what you can offer to your consumers and help them to become more conscious in their consumption and arguably more loyal in the process. So thank you very much. My name is Martin Newman, Consumer Champion. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you the next time. Thanks a lot.